um, and I was about to make another mess here. Uh, I'm just a hot mess right now because I'm just undone with the press of God. Literally last night, um, you know, I was just dumbfounded and confounded. And, uh, I'm just dumbfounded and confounded because, um, the presence of God is so, so uh, extravagant and, uh, you know, I just applaud you, Amanda, and I applaud you, Aspen, uh, the powerful duo, uh, you know, just bringing heaven. And uh, I'm really excited for all of you guys to join us. Is it good? It looks good. It's all right. Yeah. I don't go my laptop here if I have something lower. But it's all good. You know, I'm really excited. Today, I want to talk about uh, overcoming spiritual warfare. But as I was on prayer this morning, the Lord really began speaking to me to talk about the book of Revelation. And so I'm going to go into the, the, the Word of God, into the book of Revelation. You guys are going to receive. I'm telling you, we're not in the days of doom and gloom, but we are in the days of victory. We're in the days of being the triumphant church of Jesus Woo! Christ. And there's really nothing to fear. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just so undone right now by the presence of God. And even Moses himself said, we will not go forward unless your presence goes forward. And I don't want an angel. I don't want a prophetic word. I want the embodiment of prophecy. Yes. I want Jesus Christ himself to carry me, to lead me. Listen, I don't care how great your apostle is. I don't care how great your bishop is. Listen, I don't care how great the prophetic mantle on your life is. If Jesus is not the one that is leading, then I don't want to be bewitched. I don't want to be buffooned. I don't want to be misled. So I believe in these days, we need to lean into the word of God. We need to lean into the Holy Spirit and to the voice of Jesus. Amen. Uh, Mark, you can bring this closer to me here, too. I'm just going to kind of move, move it around like this. I think that this is a good setup. But as I was praying today, you know, I, I want to go into the Word of God uh, because so many people think that uh, the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book, but it's actually not. Uh, I mean, it is an apocalyptic book, but uh, everyone thinks that apocalypse is about the end of days, but actually apocalyptos in the Greek means what? Apocalyptos means revelation. And apocalypse does not mean it's the end of the world. Apocalypse means it's the revelation. Apocalyptos in Greek actually means that the two curtains, I'm sure you've been to a movie show or you've been to uh, the Broadway where, you know, you saw, uh, you know, some of those wonderful shows like Lion King and Wicked and, you know, I don't even know why they call it Wicked, but, you know, you see some of those Broadway shows and it's all closed down right now, but... You know what? We're not just, we're open, all right? We're, we're, we're not closed on Sunday. We're open, but anyways. But, uh, you know, so apocalyptos, what it means is that it's the two red curtains that's been closed. Five, four, three, two, one. Action. And a velvet red curtain, which stands for the veil that was torn. The velvet red curtain which stands for the veil that separated the Holy of Holies and the inner courts. That curtain was ripped open in half. So that curtain was ripped, and it was open and said, now it's time for the greatest show ever. Now it's time for what the heavens and the earth have been created for. Now is the time for what all the angels have been waiting to see, the great revelation, the great apocalyptos. Come on, like your hair that's being split, like the butt crack hair of the 90s, the end sink in the backstreet boys is being split like a butt crack here and it's being split. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's being split apocalyptos. The red curtain is opening up right now because it's time for the greatest apocalyptos, the greatest revelation of Jesus Christ that the world has ever seen. That's the time we're living in right now. And so revelation is the revelation of Jesus. It's actually not the revelation of the end of the world. It's not the revelation of the sky is falling. Oh, there's a big fat meatball and spaghetti that's coming on my face. No, not. Revelation has to do about Jesus. It has nothing to do about, you know, all these demonic type of things. And, you know, but revelation has to do, I'm telling you, all these shakings of the coronavirus. It's so funny because, you know, I, I, I'm pissing a lot of people off. Uh, what's new? I'm making a lot of people mad. What's new? I'm making a lot of religious people offended. And if my faith for having church gatherings still offends you, then good. Yeah. Because you need to deal with that. Uh, but I'm telling you, 
Jesus said to John the Baptist, his own cousin, hey, cousin, Jesus said to his cousin, don't be offended at me. Even the very cousin of Jesus, when he was in the womb, when he was just an embryo and growing in the belly of Elizabeth, that same cousin that left in the belly at the hearing of Mary, at the hearing of the baby Jesus in the belly of Mary, that same cousin was offended at Jesus. Are you in the flesh or in the spirit? Because if you're in the spirit, you'll never be offended. Come on. If you're in the spirit of God, you will never be offended. And unfortunately, too many people are in the flesh, so therefore they're offended. Come on, Listen, you could be on the offense or you could be offended. Big difference. Yeah. If you're on the offense, you'll never be offended. The gospel is offensive. The gospel of Jesus Christ is so offensive. That it leaves people offended. So you're either on offense or you're on defense. You're always trying to defend yourself, which means you're actually offended. Because you're all if you're always if you have a defensive spirit, you're always needing to defend yourself with another explanation or another reason, which means that you're actually offended. If, but if you're on the offense, someone say offense. If you're on the offense, then then you're on the winning team. And of course, people say the best offense is the best defense, but. But, you know, every single one of us, we need to watch our mouths. We need to watch. Put a guard over your mouth, prophet. Put a guard over your mind, man of God. Put a guard over your heart. Because uh, a lot of people are we're spewing out tainted witchcraft and tainted doctrine. We're spewing out mixture. And uh, like I said earlier, you know, I prayed. And I, I thought I was going to talk about spiritual warfare. We are going to go into some of those dynamics. But everything from Genesis to Revelation, every 66 books, has to do about the overcoming church. Has to do about the triumphant nature of the body of Christ Jesus. And it has to, listen, I will not believe in a theo theological doctrine that is not redemptive, that is not triumphant. I am not going to put my faith in a theological discourse that puts me in a place of defeat. I'm not going to put myself in believing in a doctrinal scriptural interpretation into something that's actually making me powerless, not powerful. And way too many people are have an interpretation of scripture that makes them weak. Come on, you're not weak. You are powerful. You're not a little pipsqueak chump. You are powerful. And way too many believers, Christians, denominations, fellowships, alliances are, are weaklings. They've fallen succumb to a weak doctrinal life. They've fallen succumb to an interpretation, which is your filter of a doctrine. They've come under this carnal thinking. If your theology doesn't lead you to victory, it's not of God. If your theology does not lead you to victory, then you're actually debunking the power of the truth of the Word of God, of the Holy Spirit of God, that Jesus is seated on the throne right now. Hallelujah. And your, if your theology does not lead you to victory, then what is it? If your theology keeps you bound in sin, what is it? If your theology compromises you and allows you to keep looking and acting like your old past culture, then what is it? You need to change your mind. Repent. You need to repent. Or you need to turn around. You need to change your stinking thinking. You need to change your thoughts. I'm not going to pray for you unless you're willing to change your thoughts. I'm not going to preach to you unless you're willing to change your thoughts. A wall can't change colors better than you can change your thoughts. I'm, I'd rather be talking to a dumb doorbell or a dumb doorknob then talk to somebody who's so stubborn and who's hard-headed. Come on. Stubbornness is like witchcraft. Anger is like rebellion. Stubbornness is like witchcraft, soul. You're a king. You're a president. You're a mayor. Or you're powerful. You're anointed. You think you've arrived. You think you have influence. Stubbornness is like witchcraft. Your stubbornness can move into a realm of witchcraft which means to be witty and crafty. I've already done many teachings on witchcraft. Stubbornness 
can't, because stubbornness is the pride of life, which means you're egotistic, you're proud, you're arrogant, you're stubborn, you're, you're not going to, and listen, there's a godly stubbornness, and there's a stubbornness that's wicked, but your stubbornness is like witchcraft, and, and like I said, man, that was, I, I could have dropped the mic so many times because I had so many mic drop lines right there, but this is not my mic, and my insurance will not cover this, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, if your theology doesn't lead you to victory, then it's schmeology. It's, it's schmeology for schmucks. If your theology doesn't lead you to victory, then you are, you're, you're a degenerate. You're, 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 uh, if your theology doesn't lead you, then you need to get your money back from your seminary. Come on. Then you need to get your money back from your Bible school. Then you need to get your money back from your pastor. If your theology does not lead you, come on, man, I'm going to be quoting this, man, I'm spitting lies. Spitting lies, dropping down, huh? And you might have found, huh? If your theology is not leading you to victory, and if you ever hear a pastor or a preacher talk about, like, man, you got to go through 21 steps to get victory, man, listen, we're not an AA. We're not an Alcoholics Anonymous. We're the Church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ, we love you, God. We love you, God. What a church of Jesus Christ. Jesus. So the book of Revelation has nothing to do with the end of the world. It has everything to do with the new heavens and the new earth. It has everything to do with the whole new world. Open a book like cares for you and me. It has everything to do with the red curtain, the heavy weight velvety red curtain. Greatest showtime ever. And these coronavirus times, it's revealing what you're really made of. It's revealing what churches are really made of. Please stop doing things in the name of wisdom. Please stop uh, coaxing your wisdom with, with what is actually fear. Do you know how many times people said, be careful? Be careful of what? I'm dead. I've died. Catherine Coleman would say, I've died a thousand deaths before I've come up here. And I keep on dying. I've already died. I got nothing to fear. I have nothing to lose. I'm a dead man walking. And unfortunately, too many of us want to keep on, want to hold on to our lives. Jesus himself said, if you, if you gain Shakarababa, uh, help me, Lord. If, no, 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 you're distracting me. No. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus Christ said, uh, you lose your life by giving it. But if you try to gain, then you're going to lose. <laughs> I'm telling you, God has a better plan than your 401k plan. He has a better plan than any insurance policy. Okay, he, does, he's a, he doesn't need to trick you to sign your name on the dotted line of this insurance policy. He's better than Geico. He's better than, what is that? I don't know. Mercury. Huh? Allstate. What else? Yeah. Farmers. What else? Huh? State Farm. Guy, I said that. That was the first one. Progressive. He's better than all those insurance plans. Listen, so I'm talking about the book of Revelation, amen, and uh, you're going to get so blessed. I haven't done a teaching. I've been thinking about it for maybe about a month, but I, I haven't done a teaching on the Victorious Church or on Revelation in a while. And like I said earlier, if your theology does not lead you to victory, you better get your money back. If your theology does not lead you to fall greater, or to fall more and madly in love with Jesus, then that's not theology. Okay? If what you believe in causes you to become 
causes you to become a Gnostic, causes you, be, causes you to become universal, causes you to become compromising. If your theology causes you to look like your old self from five years ago, it's not real theology. You throw it out. Okay, you throw it out. All right, and we have way too many ticklers of the ear. We have way too many ticklers of the ear. Rather than people who slap you in the face. And listen, I won't slap a woman, but I'll get one of our women to slap you if you won't. I'm just kidding. Okay, we got to edit that out. <laughs> All right, anyways, give us a baby powder, please. Listen, uh, the book of Revelation, listen, have a sense of humor, all right? Jesus was funny. He was not always serious like you. All right. Uh, so, you know, the book of Revelation, it's broken down into three parts, okay? The book of Revelation, the 22 chapters, 29, the book of Revelation is broken into three parts. The first part is the epistles, okay, which is uh, the apostle John, he's a writer. And, man, this is going to be so good. You, you're about to. Man, have you been blessed by the Open Heavens Online experience? Yeah. Man, I'm telling you, my life has changed. I'm just, I'm done. And uh, I'm just enthralled. Like, I, I'm a mess right now. I'm a puddle. <laughs> uh, I peed myself earlier. No, I did not. I am a puddle. Okay. And uh, I'm a butterfly. And uh, so, anyway, so have you been blessed? Man, I'm telling you, we're about to hit the ball out of the park today. It's like, man, we're about to get a, a grand slam today. Come on, Dodgers. Come on, don't fail us this year. All right. So the book of Revelation is broken into three parts. The first part is the epistles. Some see the epistles. And the epistles means the letters, okay? An epistle is a letter. And uh, the first part of Revelation is the epistles that Apostle John writes to the churches. Okay, the second part of the book of Revelation is apocalyptic. And again, apocalyptic, many people say, oh, it's the, it's, it has to do with the end of the world. That can be an, an interpretation, but it does have to do with the revealing of what is to come. Got it? The revealing of what is to come and the trials and the tribulations and uh, the difficulties that are to come. All right. And the third part has to do with prophecy. Okay, the third part has to do with prophecy, which really talked about the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the river of life, the throne of God, and there's all this prophetic allegory and symbols uh, that will help you uh, to understand. So the book of Revelation is broken into three parts, amen? So praise God, uh, this is going to be good, all right? There's really uh, about four chapters that we're going to highlight. At the first, we're going to go into Revelation chapter 1, and this is going to be so good. Father, I pray, even as we continue on, that uh, you would release the word of God with truth and clarity and power and revelation. And I thank you that there is no interruption in our hearts, in our homes, in our living rooms, in our bathrooms. Hallelujah. Wherever you're watching from, glory. Make sure you got your toilet paper ready. Hallelujah. And a shock up on your hand sanitizer. Bang, bang, bang. So, Father, bless your people. Fire. In Jesus' name, amen. So, first, first of all, I want to go to Revelation chapter 1. This is going to be so good, man. My gosh, I don't get paid enough. Anyways, Revelation chapter 1. I never did. Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. The things that must soon take place. Okay? And I, I'm going to go down to verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him. Come on, someone say grace. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And again, Papa James Gold last night talked about the seven spirits that are before his throne. Amen. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the rule of the king. So I love this because in verse 4, Jesus, Apostle John, excuse me, Apostle John first says, hey, you to the churches. This is how he starts off. Grace and peace to you. He doesn't first start off with, how much do you owe me? He doesn't first start off with, I judge you. I condemn you. You're a sinner. You're wrong. You did this evil in the sight of God. No. He first started to, uh, to re referring and talking to the church saying, grace and peace to you from him 
was and is and is to come. Three different uh, time, uh, uh, three different time positions, who was and is and is to come. From the eternal being, from the eternal one, I'm giving you grace and peace. I come from the eternal one who has eternal grace and peace, and that's how I'm starting my conversation with you. So to the church, I speak grace and peace. To your family, I speak grace and peace. To your loved ones that are sick, that are infirmed with coronavirus or diabetes or cancer, I speak grace and peace. Wherever you're watching from, to you, I speak grace and peace in Jesus' name. Someone say amen. And it's so funny because a lot of people, they don't talk grace and peace. They talk uh, evil and sin. They talk judgment and condemnation. They talk weakness and carnality. They, they talk about uh, witchcraft and rivalry. They talk about a whole bunch of uh, nonsense, all right? But uh, we're going to keep going down here, all right? And if you have your Bible open, the Word of God, I'm telling you, you're going to feast today. And not only am I going to teach, but I'm going to preach, okay? And not only am I going to preach, but you're going to be set free, all right? And, uh, so, and then so he begins to go on, the Apostle John. I love this. My gosh. Because in verse 9... The Apostle John says, I, John, I'm your brother, and I'm your partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. And I was on an island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, this is interesting because people say the Lord's day is like Sunday or it's a Sabbath or Shabbat, which today is Saturday Shabbat. But the Lord's day was actually a pagan holiday in that time. And I was in the spirit on that pagan holiday, Easter is coming up, pagan, Easter, Eshtarte, and it was, of course, stand for Passover or Resurrection Sunday. I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, do do do, -do say, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Los Angeles, to Orange County, to Irvine, to Ventura, and to your mama's house. <laughs> Write what you see in a book. And then he turns and to the voice. And he sees seven golden lampstands. Listen, Papa James talked a little bit about this. It's so incredible. Because first Jesus speaks, he says, John. I'm going to show you these things so you can speak to the seven churches. And, and, and then he sees the seven lampstands. Because the lampstand, the menorah, is one of the two most iconic symbols in all of Judeo-Christianity. Of course, Christian, we have the cross. But to all Jewish people, there's two main symbols that, that encompass all of Judaism. It's the Star of David. And it's the menorah, okay? The Star of David and the menorah are the two greatest symbols that embodies Jewish culture and Judeo faith. And, of course, the menorah has to, Scholars believe that the burning bush in the book of Exodus, when Moses encountered the burning bush, it was actually a menorah, which is a lampstand. And we know that Jesus is the menorah. Jesus is the lampstand. But here in John's vision, he sees seven lampstands would stand for the seven churches. Whatever platform Jesus gives you is a lampstand. Whatever gift he gives you is a lampstand. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, your voice, your gift, your piano skills, everything he gives you is a lampstand. Someone say a lampstand. It's a menorah, and you can either use it to give light or to bring glory to yourself. You can use it to give light and revelation in the darkness of times. Or you can use it to uh, and not be burning with the fire of God. You follow me? But you see, here, here's the thing. Jesus shows John the seven golden lampstands as the seven churches. You are a lampstand in this hour. Which means that you're meant to give people light, not deception. You're meant to shine the light of Jesus. Okay, you follow me? And here's the thing. In this time and hour, lampstands are enlarging, which means that he's entrusting people with a greater platform. 
He's entrusting people with a greater circumference and sphere of illumination. He is entrusting people to have greater visibility. He is entrusting ministries. He's entrusting organizations. He's giving you a bigger platform. He's giving you a national platform. He's giving you a platform like TD Jakes, Oprah Winfrey. He's giving you a platform that will not be shaken, that will not be denied, because he says, if you're using the platform that I've given you to shine the light, not to bring glory to yourself, but to bring glory to God, and if you're giving blind people vision, if you're causing people who don't see to give them vision and the clarity of the beauty of Jesus, if you're using your platform, for a problem that I'm going to enlarge in your lampstand in this hour. And that's what's happening right now. Jesus is saying, if you are a lampstand, come on, because you are a lampstand, your ministry, if you have a ministry, you have an organization, a platform, I'm going to do two things. I'm either going to enlarge in your stature, or number two, I'm going to take it away. If you do not properly steward the vision, if you do not properly steward the vision that God's giving you, the word, the Torah, which means light. If you do not properly steward the vision that God's given you, then he's going to take the lampstand away. And the greatest travesty is for people to be su successful in one day, but to be dropped dead in the next day. The greatest travesty is for somebody to have a quick shooting star, temporary, hall of fame moment, but now you're a nobody. That's the greatest travesty. We have too many shooting stars. We have too many one-night stands. We have too many people who are famous instantly, but the next day they're gone. He's going to increase your platform. He's going to increase the stature of your menorah. Your lampstand is growing in this hour. If you receive it, say amen. Listen, I could see some of you jumping up and saying hallelujah and screaming and shouting the Lord down. I can see that right now. So, so there's seven lampstands, you follow me, which stand for the seven churches. And in the midst of them is, oh, I love this. Like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, golden sash. We all get our light from the sun. The moon does not even have light without the sun. You and I do not have light or glory without the one who is glory. Hallelujah. And so he saw one, a son of man, amongst the seven churches. And here's John. Jesus is speaking to John. And of course, here's a little bit of background. John is in the island of Patmos. And this is not like Hawaii. This is not like an island of Greece. This is not Aruba. Okay, this is not Tahiti. This is Patmos. He was in a prison. Why? Because he was one of the only, I believe the only, or one of the only, uh, apostles that did not die. All the other apostles were crucified and killed and martyred. They were hung upside down. They were crucified upside down. They were tortured to death. But John the apostle was the only one that was imprisoned and was in a prison cell in Alcatraz, San Francisco. Patmos. So here's John. It's gonna, this is going to be so good. My gosh. I told you I'm going to get paid for this. Okay. Here's John. <clears throat> He's praying. And John, say John. John is the overseer of these seven churches. Okay. John is the overseer of these seven churches. And these seven churches are in Asia Minor or current day Turkey. John is the overseer of these seven churches and he's praying and he gets a word for the people he's overseeing. Listen, I'm going to teach you. You have no authority to speak into people's lives if you're not willing to pray for them. You have no authority to speak into a region unless you've been given authority to pray over them. And here's John. He's already the overseer of the seven churches in Asia Minor. And he's burdened. There's persecution happening. Come on, there's bans, religious regulations, restrictions that are happening. People are fleeing. People are dying. Christians are being martyred in this time. It's not a cool thing to be a Christian. It's not a popular thing. Hashtag, it's, you don't got the lights. You don't got the fog machines. You don't got the pastor. And there's persecution, there's shaking that's happening, and Apostle John 
the shepherd, the leader, the father of the seven churches. He's burdened. He's praying. He's seeking the face of God. And he gets a vision and a counsel from the Lord and says, I have a word that's greater than every other word. I have a word that's greater than what everybody else is saying. I know everyone has gossips, everyone's lying, everyone's prophesying, but I have a word, John, for the people that you love and for the people that you've been burdened over and for the people you've been praying into. I have a word for those people, John. The people you care for, the people you're overseeing, the people you shepherd, the people you've been praying over, I'm going to give you a word. I saw a son of man amongst the seven lampstands. Do not fear. Take heart. The son of man is amongst you. No matter what, keep your light shining, even at the darkest of times. Keep your love on, even when it's difficult. Continue to be encouraged. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Continue to stay encouraged. Continue to stay uplifted. As I'm hopeful, yes I am hopeful for today. Take this music and use it. Let it take you away. Cause we hopeful, hopeful, and you'll never win. I know it ain't easy, but ain't no way. Cause we hopeful. No, 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 no. I can't. I can't grab that. That's like, what's that? I love this. <laughs> Someone say amen. Shut up, Baba Bo. So here's John. He gets his vision. If you're receiving, say amen. All right? Type amen. If you're receiving. If you're not receiving, then bye-bye. Shut up, Baba. So seven lampstands. He's going to, he's enlarging and increasing your lampstand. Praise God. Listen, we're going to talk about seven churches. I love this. My gosh. This is so good. <laughs> oh, this is so good. Oh, hallelujah. I love this. Because in the word here, we're going to go over to Revelation chapter 2. My gosh, it's so good. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars. I love this because... Because Jesus begins to speak and says, speak to the church of Ephesus, of Smyrna, Pergamum, Tyatria. I love this. Jesus says, speak to the church of that city. So he doesn't say, speak to Potter's house. He doesn't say, speak to Elevation Worship Church. He doesn't say, speak to Bethel. He says, speak to Redding. Speak to California. He says, speak to Los Angeles. He doesn't say, don't. He doesn't say, speak to one church international. He doesn't say, speak to Potter's House. He says, speak to a region. Speak to a city. So when Jesus is talking to the church, he's talking to the collective church in the whole city. And let me tell you why this is so important. Because Jesus talks to cities. He doesn't just talk to individuals. He talks to cities. And this is where we get in attention these days because we have so much individual revelation rather than corporate revelation. We have so much personal revelation and we become so narcissistic because it's all about me and what I hear and what I see, what I feel, rather than a corporate revelation. And here's Jesus. He doesn't say, I'm speaking to one church. I'm, I'm speaking to the whole church in the city. All right? And that's why it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. It doesn't point out the one, two, three, four, five people in Sodom and Gomorrah that are sinning. That's why it says Nineveh. It talks to a whole city of Nineveh instead of just addressing the few people that are sinning in Nineveh. Does that make sense? I love this because Jesus begins to talk to uh, right here in Matthew 11, 20 to 24, Jesus began to openly criticize the cities, which he did many miracles because they did not repent. He didn't openly criticize the people. It says cities. He says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon, which are pagan, uh, pagan uh, Gentile cities, it's those same miracles that I did in 
Chorazin and Bethsaida, if I did those same miracles, then they would have turned. Capernaum, are you exalted to heaven? No, you will be thrown down to Hades. For if the miracles that I do had been done in Sodom, oh, sodomy, homosexual anal sex, sodomy. If the miracles that were done in Capernaum were done in sodomy, then actually sodomy would have turned to repentance. Oh, shut up. So Jesus begins to criticize and rebuke cities. That's why cities are so important. Cities are the mind holders or the strongholds of a region, of a nation. You follow me? That's why cities, and I'm going to talk about the book of Ephesians. I feel like I don't got enough time, but praise God, because I got places to be. Anyways, if you're receiving, you know where to find me. Follow Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Cities have gates, and uh, every every city has gates, and every gate is a portal. Okay, and the larger the city, the larger the portals. The larger the cities, the larger the portals. The larger the spiritual gates. Okay, and every city. And let's say Los Angeles, we have around 18 million uh, citizens and maybe about 4 million immigrants. So we probably have around 22, 24 million people in Los Angeles. And that's where we're still whining about the homeless people. we got to do something. And Jesus loves homeless people. And I love homeless people too. Anyways, so Los Angeles has 22, 24 million people. And uh, so... Every person is a spiritual door, okay? And so, and you have 24, which means that if one person agrees, then the door enlarges. And unfortunately, citizens or immigrants, and that's a whole other teaching, a whole other topic, because if you are actually a citizen, then you give your legal right, or you open legally the door, to certain spirits and to demonic powers and activities. <laughs> but if you're an immigrant or an alien, which means that you're actually not registered as a citizen, and as you come into this land or this territory, and you agree with certain evil powers and sins and issues, then you, it actually becomes an, even a greater injustice and a greater stronghold. Do you know why? Because you don't come under the same jurisdiction of punishment or you don't come under the same jurisdiction of discipline as the citizens. Which means that as you come as an illegal or as an alien, somebody in, into a region, and you partner with the evil powers, you will not be, be, unfortunately, you won't be dealt with in the same way and measure as the citizens. So the more aliens or the more citizens give power and open their door and their homes to evil powers and spiritual darkness then the more open doors there are and there's too many people that have opened up doors illegally too many people that have opened up doors to the demonic and to the realm of darkness illegally and even legally follow me different when it's legal and when it's illegal very different and so every city as portals. The greater the city, the more portals are opened. And that's why it's important for we as the people, the bride, the body of Christ, for us to collectively come together and open up the portals of heaven, open heaven's online experience. It's important for us as a church to open up because as we open up, then we'll have power to close. We'll have power to bind. We'll have power to release. <laughs> we'll have power to shut down. Okay? Yeah, I'm teaching that a little bit. It's a little bit. So every city has portals. And Jesus is speaking to the church in Ephesus, to the city of Ephesus. Jesus is speaking to the city of Ephesus. <sighs> I want you to open up your doors again to me. I want you, Los Angeles, close your doors to pornography. Close your doors to human trafficking. Close your doors to methamphetamine. I want you to open up your doors to holiness, to 
to righteousness, to truth, to purity. Remember, the enemy can only dilute or manipulate or take advantage of the original. The original calling of Los Angeles is to be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. To be a city of prophetic messengers, angels, angels, would stand for messenger in Latin. So the original calling of Los Angeles is to be the city of messengers. But of course, the enemy comes to pervert, dilute, deceive, and to manipulate, take advantage of that calling. I'm talking to you right now about the seven churches that Apostle John had authority over and spoke into. This is going to be so good. All right, if you're lost, say, I'm lost. If you're found, say, I'm found. All right. So we're going deeper here. All right? So we say deeper. All right. I, I want to go over to uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 2. This is so good. My gosh. Wow. You know, there's seven churches. And each, each city, and the reason why I'm talking about this is because each city actually had a calling. And each city had an anointing. Each of these cities had strengths. Okay? Each of these cities that Jesus was talking to had strengths. So your city has strengths. Hallelujah. And that's why you go into a region and somebody on top with a southern accent. Where the heck did they get a southern accent from? Oh, it's because it's in the spirit for that atmosphere. So once you cross the borderlands, once you cross the boundary lines, then all of a sudden you start talking like a southerner with an accent. Or you go into San Francisco and everybody talks like this. And ah. Or you go to Seattle and everybody has plaid shirts and windbreakers. There's, there's a spiritual likeness or a culture, cultura in Latin, which means way of life. There's a way of life in every city and region. That's why every city has a calling. Every city has an anointing. That's why you go into a city and all of a sudden you start feeling like a cowboy. Or we start wanting to have barbecue. There's anointings and giftings and callings on each city. You follow me. And here, Jesus begins to applaud each of these cities, each, each of the churches. And then he begins to correct them. And then he begins to give them a promise. He gives each church a promise. Ah, that is so good. He, he calls out the gold in every church, in every city, in every region. And then he shows them the place where they can turn and become better at. And he says, if you turn and become better and change in this, then this is what you're going to receive. God is so good. He's so gracious. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. So uh, first church, of course, Ephesus. And if you're sweating like me right now because it's hot up in her, say Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, first church here is the church of Ephesus. My God, so good. Hallelujah. The church of Ephesus. All right. Church of Ephesus. Praise God. First church. And the church of Ephesus, of course, is where the Ephesian revival took place. Okay. And Ephesians, you know, spiritual warfare. You know, we talk about all these things, the armor of God. But this is the same region that Apostle John is talking to right now. And he says this. There's many great qualities. Hallelujah. Uh, he says, I know your works and your toil and your patient endurance. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil. I know you tested those who call themselves apostles, but they're actually apostles. They're actually apostates. They're actually apophics. And they're not. And you found them to be false. I know you, you are enduring patiently. Someone say enduring. And you're bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. How many viewers are on? Did it lessen? One talking about, listen, I lost like five viewers since I first started speaking. That's awesome. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. You have not grown weary, but I have this against you. Hey, listen, you're beautiful, you're kind, you're awesome, but I got this one thing against you. 
If you don't change this, you see the dog. I have this one thing against you. You abandoned the love that you had at first. Uh, first love. <laughs> I lost my first love. Which means I'm working hard. Jesus, don't you see? I'm giving. Don't you see me? I'm, I'm worshiping with all my might. Don't you see me? I'm faithful. Man, I came even earlier than the janitor. Don't you see me, Jesus? I, I'm working hard. And Jesus said, I see all your works. I know how you've endured. But I have one thing against you. You lost your first love. You're actually acting like a religious, dutiful robot rather than somebody who's in love with me. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do, but you're not doing it because you're in love with me. What happened to your heart? Where's the motivation? Is there an agenda now? Are you trying to work? Are you trying to perform? Oh, somebody help me preach it. And he says, you lost your first love. And it's 1146, so I have 14 minutes. You lost your first love. Remember from where you've fallen and repent and do the words you did at first. If not, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from this place. I said you. I will remove your lampstand from this place unless you repent. Ooh, my God. And then I'm going to go over to verse 7 because it's so good. But he who has an ear to hear, come on, Dumbo, let me see your little big flaps. He who has ears to hear, come on, stop acting like your mama didn't pull on your ear because you even listen. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. What are you hearing? Fake news? Propaganda? Conspiracy? He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I'm telling you, the book of Revelation is about the conquering church. The book of Revelation is about the church that conquers. And Jesus says, listen, if you conquer, then I'm going to grant you the ability to eat from the tree of life. I'm going to give you the tree of life, which means it's like you never fell or it's like you never sinned. Oh, I'm going to bring you back to the place of the garden as if Adam and Eve never fell. I'm going to bring you to the place of immortality, bring you into the place of such glory where outside of God, there's, there's no such thing. Yeah. But to the one who conquers, some say conquers. Oh, this is so good. All right. Our second church, Church of Smyrna. I know your tribulation and your poverty. You are rich, but you are rich in the slander of those that are of the Jews, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear. You're about to, you're about to suffer. Oh, well, that's a good promise. Thanks, Jesus. I'm about to suffer. Thanks. Behold, the devil is about to throw you, some of you, into prison. Oh, it gets even better. So that you may be tested for 10 days of that tribulation. Let's hear this. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. <laughs> faithful unto death? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Okay. So there's a first death, and there's a second death. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. I may die in the first death, but I'm going to be untouchable on the second death. Oh, Jesus, you're going to go to trial and tribulation. You're going to be tested. Some of you are going to go to prison. But I'm telling you, Church of Smyrna, if you endure and if you conquer, say conquer. If you conquer, then you are not going to taste the second death. Your temporary sufferings are, are collecting an eternal way of glory for you. Every church, seven churches, just seven promises. A prophetic promise over each church. He's saying you can conquer. You're made to conquer. We are the conquering church. Oh my gosh, it gets better. You gotta, you guys gotta help me finish. Help me finish, Jesus. He begins to speak to the church of Pergamum. 
the church of Los Angeles. Oh, this is going to get so good. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast to my name. You don't deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, there's so much concern to teach. My faithful witness was killed among you. But I have a few things against you. Just a few things. <laughs> you bought into the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to a uh, stumbling block of Israel, who was a false prophet, who sacrificed to idols and practiced sexual immorality. So also some of you hold fast to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. They were a cult group. Therefore, repent. If not, I will soon come to you and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. But he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. This is so good. Not only am I going to give you the hidden cookies. Not only am I going to give you the hidden brownies. I hid those brownies from your brothers because I love you. I hid that last piece of chocolate cake from all of them. I hid it just for you. I'm going to give you the hidden manna. And not just that. I'm going to give you a white stone which stands for holiness and purity and being refined by the fire of God. I'm going to give you the white stone with a new name written on the stone, which no one else knows about. If you conquer, if you pass the test of sexual immorality, if you pass the test of the stumbling blocks, if you, hallelujah, if you conquer, then I'm going to give you these promises. If you receive it, say amen. amen. To the church of Thyatira. Oh, and this talks about Jezebel. You know, Jezebel don't even say He says to the church in Tyatra, I know your works, your love and faith and service, your patient endurance. I know that you worked hard for this broadcast. I know that you worked hard to make this conference happen the last few days. I know. But I have this against you. I have two fingers. What movie is that from? I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. You tolerate that woman to be in your meeting. You tolerate that woman to be in your church meeting. You tolerate that evil spirit to manipulate and to seduce and to, oh, shut up. Who calls, she calls herself a prophetess. And is teaching and seducing my service to practice sexual immorality and to eat the sacrifice idols. Eat food to sacrifice idols. I gave her time to repent. But she refuses to repent. So behold, I'm going to throw her into a sick bed, and there's so much we can go into that. All right, there is a spirit of Jezebel. It's not just Jezebel that was a woman in the days of King Elijah, okay, in 1 Kings, 2 Kings. But there's also a spirit of Jezebel embodied as Artemis, Madonna, Guan Yin, so, so many of these other things, these spirits are enacted. And you can even see TV shows on Netflix and all that called Jezebel. They're sick. Fire. Oh, Shabbat Shabbat Shabbat. All right. Well, I'm just going to keep going on here. Wow. Wow. Verse 26. The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end to him, I will give authority over the nations. The nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as with earthen pots were broken in pieces, even as I myself receive authority from my father. Even as I received authority from my father, I will give you that same authority to rule over nations. If you pass the test of Jezebel. And I will give him the morning star. Which stands for Jesus, the rising of the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Guys, can you handle this? There's just so many rewards for the one who conquers. Yes. Are you a chump? Or are you a conqueror? I am more than a conqueror. We're victorious. Are you a loser or are you a winner? Do you have faith or are you in fear? Do you have the spirit of the world? Do you have the spirit of God? 
You have the spirit of the age. You have the spirit of Jesus. Spirit of glory. Stand up on my own. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3. To the church of Sardis. My God. I know your reputation of being alive, but you're actually dead. I, I know people say you got the best music, you got the best worship music, the best songs. I know they say you got the best production cast, you got the most influence on YouTube, but you're actually dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found the works complete in the sight of my God. Remember what you received and earth, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. Hallelujah. Give me about 10 more minutes, like every other Pentecostal preacher says. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 5, the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments. And I will never blot his name out from the book of life. I will never blot your name out from the book of life. Which means that you can actually blot my name out from the book of life. But if I conquer, you will never block my name out from the book of life. And Jesus said, I will confess your name before my father and before his angels. I will confess Koso before my father. I will confess your name Miriam before my father and all the angels. I will confess your name Louis before my father. And all of his angels, I will confess, my gosh, will you conquer? Will you overcome this pandemic of fear, this epidemic of faithlessness, this epidemic of lawlessness? Will you conquer? Because I want to keep your book, your name in the book of life. You see that? It says saved. You see that? It says Timothy. You see that? It's in the book of life. And not only that, but when I when I get to read out your name, I'm going to read it out to the Father. Hey, Daddy. Yeah, his name's written on the book of life. Yeah, he's good. Beep. Hey, hey, Papa. Yeah, she's written. Yeah, her name's written in the book of life. I know it looks like Jessica Kim, but it's actually Jessica Merz. Her name is written in the book of life. She's good. Beep. Thanks, Dad. Thanks for trusting in me to confess to you whose name is written in the book of life. Thanks. Amen. To the church in Philadelphia, cheesesteak. <laughs> <sighs> All right. I'm getting tired. So I'm going to bring this to a close. <laughs> I've been doing it for three days, y'all. You see it at home. And I got to preach tonight in North Hollywood. I got to preach tomorrow morning here. My gosh, I told you I'd get paid enough for this. <laughs> I don't do this for pay ever. Okay. Uh, what's up, blah, blah, blah. All right. Yada, 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 yada. Philadelphia. Yeah, you say you got the best cheese steaks, but not really. Yeah, Philadelphia. Born by Philadelphia. Born and raised in the playground. I'm going to spend most of my days. All right, Philly. Okay, okay. Uh, Philadelphia. Yeah, I rebuke you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the one who conquers. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never will he go out of it. I will write, I will write on him the name of my God. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna write a tattoo on you. Okay? Alright now. Some of you have tattoos from your fake lovers. Some of you have tattoos of your fake idols. You have tattoos of your mama's name, your papa's name. But Jesus is saying, I'm gonna write on you the name of my God. You're going to have, you're going to be marked. You're going to be branded. You are going to have the written letter. It is written on your body of God. That's not the mark of the beast. It's the mark of Jesus. Just saying. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Wow, so good. Which means that it's like your license, your birth certificate. Your social security number. I'm gonna write that on you. You like this, Amanda? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're the best. The New Jerusalem doesn't say old. Catch that. 
which comes down from my God. He wasn't here to hear letting No one, no conquers, they conquers. And uh, I think this is the last church, hallelujah. And to the church in Laodicea, I know your works, you're neither hot or cold. All right? You ain't that hot. You ain't that good looking. All right? I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth like some dog vomit. I'm going to spit you out like the McDonald's I just had for breakfast. I'm going to spit you out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like, like a baby spits out right after it eats his food. For you say, I am rich, I prosper, I need nothing, not realizing you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. I'll, I counsel you, Los Angeles. I counsel you, Laodicea. Buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and a white garment so that you may clothe yourself, and a shame of young butt nakedness may not be seen, and put the salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and eat with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Sit with me on my throne. If you conquer Laodicea, I'm going to allow you to sit with me on my throne. You know, Pastor Benny Hinn's chair in the studio? I'm going to let you sit with me on Pastor Benny Hinn's chair. Wow. What? That's the chair that no one else can touch and no one else can sit on. Yeah. I'm going to let you sit with me on my chair. Yeah. Not on the regular chair, but the crowd that's over there in the nosebleed seaters. Right here. On my throne, says the Lord. Someone say amen. amen. Wow. Shababa. As I also conquered. What, Jesus? You also conquered? And sat down with my father on his throne. Okay, this is so good. Man. Jesus says, if you conquer, then I'm going to let you sit on my throne with me. As I also conquer, and I sit with my father on his throne. Jesus says, I conquer, and now I'm sitting with my father on his throne. You follow me? And if you conquer, then you can sit with me on my throne. So which throne is it? Jesus' throne or the father's throne? Which place are you seated in? Jesus' throne or the Father's throne? If you conquer, you don't only sit on Jesus' throne. You sit with Jesus on the Father's throne. Come on. That's it. Where's that? Uh, you guys don't hear me today. Yeah. Glory. And in Revelation 4, verse 1, After this I looked and behold the door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard say to me, Come up here. Let me show you what must take place. My gosh, so good. Wow. Wow. At once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. <sighs> and of course, it talks about the emerald and the jasper carnelian. I don't have to talk about all that. Although there is a prophetic teaching of Revelation, all of them, of course. And around the throne, four living creatures, and they all cry out, holy, 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 holy. What throne are you seated on? What throne are you surrounding? Oh, my gosh. All these promises are stacked up for the one who conquers and overcomes. Someone say, preach, Pastor Ben. All right, I'm going to preach. I said, so someone. All right. I'm about to bring this to a close here, man. Uh, I didn't. I didn't even talk about a lot of stuff that I wanted to, but this is good because everything in life has to do with conquering. Remember, you're either the prey or you're the pet predator. You're either a victim or you're a victor. 
you're, you're either uh, a defender or you're being offended. And everything in this life has to do with conquering. And you overcome spiritual warfare by knowing that it's done in the heavenlies. It's already finished. Jesus did it all at the cross. If the cross is not sufficient for your victory today, then you don't know Jesus. If your cross is not sufficient, listen, you don't need a prophetic word to go through. You need to cross. You don't need another prophetic word to keep you going and deceiving. You need to acknowledge the cross of Jesus Christ. Devils can manipulate prophecies, but the devil can never manipulate the cross. The cross is sufficient. That's where everything was done. And John says, Behold, I see one seated on the throne. He says, In the midst of all the trial and tribulation, I see Jesus. He's seated on the throne. And church, wake up. If you are able to conquer and to overcome, then you will receive these promises. You will receive these rewards. And I'm showing you what must take place and what's going to happen. Not so that you can be depressed and oppressed. But I'm showing you these things. So that you will have faith. Because he's overcome it all. Wow. He's overcome it all. Revelation 22. Jesus says, verse 7, Behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of this prophecy and of this book. My gosh. He says, I've overcome the world. Someone say overcome. This word overcome, and I'm going to have the worship team come up in a minute. This word overcome is Nike. Say Nike. Which is actually Nike. The word overcome in the Greek is Nike, which means prevail, subdue, have power over, overcome. And which means to be victorious, to conquer, and to, be, uh, and to have victory. So Nike comes from the Greek word Nikao, N I K A O. Where do you think the brand Nike comes from? So Jesus is saying, if you will Nike and just do it, I'm going to give you some new sneakers. If you can Nike, Nikeo, if you can conquer, hallelujah, then I'm going to give you these rewards. I only scratch the surface. I only scratch a quarter of this whole teaching that I can do right now. So good. Jesus says, if you can nikau, if you can conquer, prevail, subdue, then I'm going to give you these rewards. What rewards, you may ask? And dang those people who don't believe in rewards in the Christian life. Because there is such a thing as rewards and as rankings. There is. Wow. He says, listen, Ephesus, if you overcome, then I'll give you the tree of life. Who wants the tree of life today? Yeah. Not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life. If you overcome, if you, Nikau, I'm going to give you some Jordans. All right. Tree of life, lifetime subscription, lifetime warranty, and no one's ever going to step on them. <laughs> if you overcome, I am. Hallelujah. I am. You will not be hurt by the second death. If you overcome, you won't be hurt by the second death. My gosh. That's so good. If you overcome, oh, uh, if you overcome that, I'm going to give you the hidden manna, the hidden brownies. I'm going to give you the white stone with a new name on it. If you overcome. If you overcome, I'm going to give you power over nations. Authority, a rod of iron, and a morning stone. Wow. If you overcome, 
I'm going to give you white garments and a book of, and I'm going to write your name in the book of life. So, if you overcome, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar. Substantial piece and part of the whole temple. Wow. Wow. You won't be moved. You, you, we need pillars in the temple to hold it up. If you overcome, you're going to be a pillar in the temple. My gosh. If you overcome, then you will sit with me on my throne. Stop sitting in the kitty chair. Stop sitting in the high chair of babies. You're meant to sit on the throne with me. Stop sitting on a pedestal. Stop sitting on your lazy boy at home. Sit on the throne. Get off your toilet, wipe your bottom, and sit on the throne and rule and reign with Jesus. These naked shoes aren't going to tie themselves. Nikau, overcome. For everything. Glorify. You're meant to overcome. Wow. You're meant to overcome. <sighs> you can you take the stand away. Yeah, okay. You're meant to overcome. You're not a loser. You're not a victim of your past. You're not a victim of any lie. You're not a victim of situation that's happening in America. You are not a victim. Okay? You're not a loser. All right? You're not orphaned. All right? You have the spirit of God. You have the spirit of truth, the spirit of righteousness. Guys, I can't emphasize this enough. Yeah, we could talk about praying in tongues. Yeah, we could talk about the cross. Yeah, we could talk about, you know, Shaka Bahaya. We could talk about worship is your weapon. Yeah, we could talk about power of the principalities and rulers and hosts of heaven. And we could talk about all those different dimensions of authority and power. But the most important thing is Jesus. You have Jesus, don't you? I'm not talking about your cousin, Jesus. I'm not talking about your uncle, Jesus. I'm not talking about the, the, the Mexican truck guy named Jesus down the street. I'm talking about Jesus. Yeshua. <laughs> the savior of the tacos. The savior of the world. I'm talking about that Jesus. In midst of the seven lampstands, I see one that's seated. In midst of the churches that's quarreling, that's arguing. Who has the biggest ministry? Who has this? Who's the greatest? We the best. Who we have the best doctrine? Who we have the best lights? In midst of all these churches complaining and arguing, who has the biggest lampstand? He says, I see one in the midst of them. He's seated on the throne. <sighs> Hallelujah. 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 We are the conquering church, people of God. This too will pass. He's about to unveil, like the butt crack hair of the Backstreet Boys in the 90s. Scooby Dooby Doo, where are you? He's about to unveil. He's about to tear the veil of Moses, of religion, of condemnation. It's about to tear open the veil so that you can see the power that's on the inside of you. Someone said, I am created to conquer with Christ. Come on, say, I am created to conquer with Christ Jesus. People are saying this is the end of the world. It's the end of something. We're far from being done with the end of the world. People are saying, oh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm like, man, just, just do something. You're powerful. We're the overcoming church. We're the, we're, we're the prevailing church. A 
Hallelujah. And that is the prophetic vision and word of encouragement that the Apostle John received from Jesus on the island of Patmos. He received to share to the churches. That's right. He received to share to the churches. You're not weak, people of God. Amen. I feel so sad for a lot of people right now. I feel so broken. I really do. We're not ready for what's going to come. We're not ready for what's going to come. We are not ready for what's going to come. I'm telling you, it's going to be more shakings. There's going to be more tests and trials and tribulations. But Jesus is with you. Jesus. Listen, guys, then it's time. Listen, I'm so undone right now. I'm rejoicing. I'm happy. Not because we're finished with the broadcast and this open heaven online experience, but I'm happy because I feel the favor of God. I feel the presence of the Lord. He's so pleased with you. He's so happy with you. Listen, guys, in this moment, as you have your eyes closed, your heads bowed, your hands lifted up. Ha! Father, I declare a fresh fire, fresh faith, fresh power. I declare now in Jesus' name that you will dethrone every lie, that you will destroy every demonic entity. God, I pray that you will release angels of assistance. I declare right now he's enlarging in your lampstand. Your light will never be dimmed. Your light will never be darkened. I declare right now over these people, oh God, that you will cause them to conquer. You will cause them to prevail. You will cause them to be victorious. You will cause the church of Jesus Christ to shine. This is the greatest hour of the church. And he says, arise and shine. For though the earth is filled with gross darkness, your light has come. Arise and shine. Arise and shine. Some say hallelujah. Listen, guys, I want to thank all of you. Don't, don't leave yet. Because we're going to give a free giveaway. And um, and the man is going to sing. Happy, happy 